The Game Boy. Nintendo's first handheld and the console that kickstarted the portable gaming market. Home to classics like Tetris and Pokemon, the Game Boy sat in a special place in everyone's hearts. During the development of the system, Nintendo had wanted to create a game using their mascot, Mario, and use it as a launch title. The development of such a game was given to Nintendo R&D 1, led by Gunpei Yokoi, the creator of the Game Boy. And eventually, Super Mario Land was a part of the handful of titles, kicking off one of Nintendo's most successful endeavors. This game is the fourth in the Super Mario Bros. series, but also the first Mario game to not have Shigeru Miyamoto working on it. The game consists of 12 levels total, which is shockingly low. The original Super Mario Bros. has almost three times that, at 32 levels. However, I don't know if I'm making this up in my head or not, but I feel like these levels are just a little bit longer than your traditional Mario game. Not by a lot, and I don't have any proof of this, but I just have that feeling. But anyways, in this game you obviously play as Mario. But instead of the Mushroom Kingdom, you're running and jumping in Sarasa Land, trying to save Princess Daisy from the evil Tatanga. That's right, this is actually the first appearance of Daisy in a Mario game. And unfortunately, it's also the last time she ever appears in a mainline Mario game, for some reason. This is kind of a side tangent, but does anyone else find it weird that so many Mario enemies and characters that are pretty well known nowadays come from relatively obscure places. I mean, there are certain Mario games in the franchise that are kind of like black sheeps of the family. They don't really fit in with the others, and they kind of stand out because they're different. And yet, they traditionally are the least known entries in the series. I'm talking about Mario 2, uh, Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2. Stuff like that. Like, most new video game players aren't going to know that Daisy was in a mainline Mario game. They're only going to know her from the spin-offs, like Waluigi. Some other examples of what I'm talking about are like Shy Guys, Sniffits, Ninjis, and Birdo from Mario 2, or Pauline after her recent resurgence as a character, which I find really weird. She didn't have much of a character up until, uh... I think the Mario vs. Donkey Kong series, I think, is where she really started to get a character. And then she was brought back into Odyssey, which I believe is the first mainline Mario game that she's actually in. Um, if you don't count, like, Donkey Kong, which I don't, and I don't think Nintendo does either. But then this brings up the question, why are, like, shy guys staple enemies, but not this bird thing? What is it called? Ah, tweeters. I like that. Tweeters are now my favorite Mario enemy. Anyways, moving on from that, maybe I can actually talk about the game for five minutes. There are four worlds with three levels in each world. It's pretty clear this game is intended to be taking the Super Mario Bros. formula and translating it down for weaker hardware. And I think that was the best idea they could have had, because it works really well here. The team was also allowed to let their creativity shine, as most of the enemies you find in this game are completely new. Maybe this goes to show what happens when you take Miyamoto out of the picture. But I digress. This game receives high praise for being a great translation of Mario on a handheld. It also receives some weird looks, because it's so different from other entries in the series. But does it hold up all of these years later? Let's find out. For this video, we will go through each level one by one, and I will detail my experience with the level and anything else interesting I'd like to talk about. At the end, I will share my general feelings about the game and anything else I'd like to add. First up is 1-1. You know how it goes, it was a pretty standard Mario experience, but there are a few interesting things about it already. First, this has got to be the only Mario game that starts you off in a desert theme. In fact, the themes of this game are overall way better than a normal Mario game, at least in my opinion. The second interesting thing about it is that it's our first experience with new enemies. Some of the enemies in this game are variations on traditional Mario enemies. For example, the Goombo is basically the same as a normal Goomba. 
The bombshell Koopa functions similarly to a normal Koopa, but instead of being able to kick the shell around, it blows up in your face. Although not a variation, a fly also appears during this level. 1-2 is also a pretty standard level and has an athletic theme, but this is also when I started realizing some of the issues with this game. There were a few times where I would hit the jump button and I would walk right off a cliff, or it looks like I'll land on an enemy and I'm out of the way of projectiles, but I still end up getting hit. It just generally feels like it controls very loosely, and that hitboxes are not as accurate as they seem. I just chalked it up to Game Boy jank though, and I moved on. This level also has the first and only appearance of the Bun Bun enemy. 1-3 is the first of what would be castle levels in other Mario games. In this game, however, they've decided to opt for unique levels to go with their unique bosses. The level is pretty simple, and I got through it, but not without a couple deaths. I was starting to realize how hard the game was. My theory is that the difficulty in the slightly longer levels are there specifically because there are so few levels. That way, people would have a longer experience with the game as a whole. I don't have any proof of this either, but it's just a thought. For the most part, I don't mind this. It's nice to play a harder Mario game every once in a while, and using the difficulty to lengthen a game isn't always a bad thing. However, there is one decision that they made in this respect that is completely unforgivable. But we will talk about that later. This level contains the first appearance of the Bow and the Prana Plant, which is the only old Mario enemy that has not had its name altered. At the end of 1-3, you are met with King Todumesu, a Sphinx boss who shoots fireballs at you, similarly to the Bowser fights in the original Super Mario Bros. Once you jump over him and hit the button, he's toast. You move forward, find Daisy, only to find that she is actually a transformed fly. Well, on to the next world, I guess. 2-1 was a pretty standard level. Honestly, not too much to say about it besides its water theming. It's worth noting also that if you're playing in the Super Game Boy on the Super Nintendo, that it looks red, as if you're above a river of blood. Yikes. It is also the first appearance of the Honin Fish and the Uraren Boo. 2-2 is what introduced me to the worst decision that any video game could ever make. When you game over, you are sent to the very beginning of the game. Needless to say, I was not prepared for this information. Hang on. No. You can't do this to me. This was most definitely a decision to pad out playtime, but this is the kind of feature that would have stopped me from playing if I was younger, out of frustration of losing everything. Imagine being on the last level and having to start all the way over. Hey guys, this is Editor Connor. Uh, you'll hear from me later, but I just wanted to pop in and say that I was wrong here. At least I think. Um, I've actually tried recording this a few times, but I think I just figured out, like, really how to word what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I was wrong. I don't think that they did the game over thing because they wanted to pad up playtime. I think the difficulty in the longer levels probably have something to do with that but I don't think they did it to pad up playtime. They did it because they made this into not a traditional Mario game. As much as I'm talking about it like it's traditional, and as much as the game itself is presenting itself as traditional, that is not what it is. Um, it isn't a progress-based game. It's a score-based game. Um, the points actually matter quite a lot in this game um, because it's what's displayed on the title screen every time you open up the game. Don't quote me on this, but I believe even if you die, even if you game over, your points are still recorded and put on the t on title screen. Um, so that would mean that every time you play the game, you're trying to beat your previous score and trying to get further and further in the game. So it's not progress-based. You're not trying to get to the end. You're trying to rack up as many points as possible, um, which, which changes how you would look at the game a little bit, um, changes how I look at the game a little bit. So this is a little bit like... The rest of this video, it's not wrong. The game is like my this whole video isn't wrong and like what I'm saying, but it's just like it's good. It's a little bit of a different look at it, you know. 
Um, it's a little weird. Uh, but I just wanted to add that in, that I was not right. And in my anger, although I was... <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea for you to uh, <laughs> ever send a player back to the beginning of the game because they got a game over. Even if it's like a stylistic choice. I guess it works better for this type of game, but it just is very frustrating for a Mario game to be sent back to the very beginning after you've struggled to get where you were before. Like, if I was on 4-3, the last level of the game, and I fucking died at the final boss and got sent all the way back to the beginning of the game, I'd be fucking pissed. And I feel like I'd be rightfully so. And so that's why I, I, I thought I should... Um, mention that in the video because I was I was so mad when it happened I was so fucking mad um and I, I, it still pisses me off but it's not I understand why they did it now and I just want you to understand why they did it too and at least my interpretation of why they did it um I this went on a little longer than I wanted it to but yeah um I will be seeing you later because I have something else to add but it isn't until later so yeah after realizing that, yes, this was indeed what just happened, I resolved to use save states from that moment forward. I can hear your boos from here, but I didn't want to be sitting there for six hours playing the same levels over and over again on what was essentially a game you could beat in under an hour. Call me a cheater. See if I care. I just wanted to beat the game in a reasonable amount of time. After about ten minutes, I made it back to 2-2. Honestly, it's mostly a decent level with a decent challenge, which is how I got game over in the first place. This is also when I started realizing why the controls felt so weird. Mario's momentum in this game is completely awkward. You speed up incredibly fast, but slow down incredibly slow. It makes it so it's very easy to walk off a platform when trying to get a running start, or not be able to stop your momentum and jump off an enemy into a pit. I was still attributing it to the game being on the gameplay but it was starting to become a problem. As the difficulty increases, you're expected to make tighter jumps, but the controls just don't help you at all. It definitely led to some frustrating deaths that felt a little bit unfair. 2-2 is also the first and only appearance of the Mechabon, which is a renewable resource for points, as its head can be destroyed for points, and it regenerates. So just sit there, letting it throw its head at you, and you should be all right to rack up some points. 2-3 introduces us to one of the more interesting parts of the game. Here we are in a shooter type level in a submarine. Actually, kind of reminds me of uh, Wario Land Shake It now, now that I'm looking at it. The level isn't particularly hard, but it's an auto-scroller that throws a bunch of enemies at you at once. It has several new enemies. The Torion, the Urarin, which is actually different than the Urarin Boo, and the Gunyan. I think that the difference between the Urarin and the Urarin Boo has to do with how they move and how you kill them. Um, obviously you find them in different kinds of levels, but the Urarin Boo moves up and down and the Urarin just moves left and right. Um, and also you aren't able to kill the Urarin Boo with uh, the Super Ball, which the... Uh, you, you kind of fire Super Balls out of your submarine, although also kind of not. but. You know, it's one of those things where it's just kind of a technicality, and I guess the game is following that technicality, you know? I believe also that Urarin Boos specifically shoot fireballs. I don't think normal Urarins do. But, I digress. Since this is the end of the second world, you're met with the boss at the end. Dragon Zamasu, a big Urarin Boo that shoots fireballs. Um, this is also highlights, I think, why Urarin Boos are different. Um, this is the only Urarin Boo that we find underwater, so it makes sense that since he shoots fireballs and he moves up and down, that he would be considered a Urarin Boo. You can defeat it by shooting it, but you can also apparently skip right by it if you choose. A Tamau bounces around the arena as well. 3-1 is the first level that made me want to pull my hair out. If I wasn't using save states, this level would have been what would have made my playthrough six hours. For some reason, it never occurred to me to save state as I progressed through the level, so I kept getting further but I couldn't make any progress because I kept dying later in the level. This is obviously my own fault, but still frustrating. 
As frustrated as I was, I knew I had to keep pressing on. After almost 20 minutes, which is a long time for this game, I finally beat it. This level has an Easter Island theme, and several new enemies show up. The level actually has this pretty cool part where you use a jumping rock to cross over a pit of spikes. The only problem with this is that if you even barely touch the side of this two block moving platform, you die instantly, which has caused me several of what felt like unfair deaths. Um, it's worth noting that when I wrote this, I, I didn't mean die instantly as in like, you'll get killed, like, like a pit or something. I meant like, you, you get hurt. I don't know why I wrote it like that. Anyway, this is the first appearance of Bullet Biffs, which are not Bullet Bills, Batadons, Tokotokos, and weirdly enough, the rocks are considered enemies, and they're called Ganchan. 3-2 is in a sort of cave, with plenty of spiders rolling around. I'm not personally a big fan of spiders, but I don't know. This one gives me good vibes. Anyway, there isn't much to say about this level, except that it has some pretty tight platforming. I absolutely hate the single block platform that has a spike falling down from the ceiling when you're under it. If your game doesn't have the tightest controls for one reason or another, you should adjust for that in the level design so you don't have this ridiculously challenging parts like this. This level is also the first appearance of the Su and the Kumo. 3-3 is probably my favorite level of the whole game. It's an athletic theme with plenty of moving flying platforms, and it's just the right level of challenging to be fun without getting too frustrating. I did end up dying a lot towards the end, but it wasn't too bad. The boss in this world is my favorite. Hiyoi Hoi is another Easter Island head that throws Ganchan at you. Jump on the Ganchan, hit the button to win. 4-1 was another level that took a long time to complete. Lots of tight platforming with plenty of enemies, and very easy to make stupid mistakes. However, I was noticeably less irritated than usual playing it. I think I was focusing a lot on the music for some reason, and I think I just didn't realize that it took that long. I mean, the music's good, but I, I just couldn't seem to shut up about it. Most songs that, like, try to use that style of sound use that scale. If you don't know what that is, a pentatonic scale is like a scale with only five notes. Most scales have uh, eight, eight notes in them. Oh. This feels like an appropriate game to get mad at, though, is the thing. Like, I'm upset, but I'm not like upset to the point where I'm gonna like hate the game for it. I'm, app I'm appropriately upset. Anyway, after about 20 minutes, I beat the level. This level is the first appearance of the Pianpi, which you might not see it at first, but these are supposed to be Jiangxi, which is basically a Japanese zombie vampire. 4-2 is a pretty good level with two distinct themes. The first is a block theme, while the second is as if you've entered a castle, with rotodiscs and all. It's pretty cool, and another fairly difficult level, and there's not much more to say about it. It's the first and last appearance of the Pon Pon Flower, and the Nya... Nyo... 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 Lin? Not Nyo... Lo... Lin. Nyo... Lo... Lin. Enemies. Man, I was... I was doing so well before. I wasn't... Per I don't think I was doing it perfectly, but man, that was, that was rough. Sorry if I butchered some of these names. Um, anyway. This level is also the last platforming level in the game. You'll see what I mean in a second. And by a second, I mean right now. 4-3 is the final level of the game, and weirdly enough, it's another shooter level, this time in an airplane. On one level, it's a strange decision, since this is the last impression many people will have with the game, and traditionally you don't want your platformer to leave a shooter impression on the player. On another level, it seems like a bad decision, since usually shooter levels tend to be easier than normal levels, and you don't really want the final level to be easy. But there's something I realized. I think I figured out why they did this. They wanted to make the final boss more difficult. Most of the bosses in the game are pushovers, since you can jump right over them for the most part. But without that option, it's more difficult to stay alive, and simultaneously more difficult to hit the boss enough to kill it. The rest of the level is pretty standard bullet hell, and has plenty of unique enemies, which are the Chicken, Rocketon, Chikako, and Pipe Fist. Yes, that's, that's the name of the enemy, Pipe Fist. 
The level ends with the final boss battle, which has two phases. Phase 1 is against Biokintu, a cloud-like creature that moves around the arena and throws chickens at you. Keep firing at him, and then Phase 2 will start against Tatanga, the spaceman who kidnapped Daisy. And honestly, he was way harder than I expected. After essentially already fighting a boss before him, it is shocking how much different he is than the other bosses. Most of the others you were dodging attacks and mostly attacking the boss, but here you can't do that. The name of the game is spamming attacks and focusing on dodging his, because his attacks are fast and you don't really have time to process everything. But eventually, Tatanga is defeated and you share a heartfelt reunion with Daisy before watching the credits roll. And as some sweet music plays, we watch as we are told, the end. Overall, I really enjoyed my time with this game. Although there are certain questionable decisions, in general the level design was really good, and it forces you to take your time, which is something I struggle with in Mario games. The soundtrack is really good, often considered to be the best part of the game. The Super Ball is the only real power up here besides the Mushroom and Star, and although I do really like the Super Ball as a concept, it isn't great in reality. You need to use a lot of precision to hit your targets, which is really hard to do, or get right up in the enemy's face, which is dangerous. Not to mention, you can only fire one at a time. It's nice to get, but it's the kind of thing you don't go out of your way for. The shooter levels are really cool, but they seem a bit out of place here, especially since they're both final levels in Worlds. I honestly think that if they made those normal levels, but made a separate game that's a shooter, it would have done really well. It would have played better into the high score type gameplay style that they're going for here as well. Regardless, it's all really fun to play through and definitely a decent Mario experience on the go. I only really had two major complaints with the game, and unfortunately, they're really big. First, the controls are just very, very jank. And sometimes the hitboxes are too... Ugh. It's very easy to walk off platforms or to jump off an enemy and fall uncontrollably into a pit. It's also easy to accidentally hit the side of an enemy when you thought you landed on their head. But it's also common to run into the side of them and then suddenly jump off them anyways. None of this would be that big of a deal if it weren't for the level design not really accommodating. There are plenty of times where they expect tight platforming and it becomes way harder than intended. Alright, hello, Editor Connor is back, um, and I just wanted to say a couple things here. Um, after writing this script, I watched Chucka Conroy's like two videos on the game because I just wanted to know whether there was anything I missed and whether uh, there was anything I should add to the script. Um, well, <laughs> something that I noticed right off the bat, was that he called this a, like, he, he basically called it a really easy game and said that lives were useless. And I was shocked by that, because I had a lot of trouble with the game, naturally. So I was just like, what? This is crazy. You can't be serious. This, this isn't, like, an easy game. Like, you need as many lives as you can get, right? So the reason I'm, the reason I'm here is I want to preface all of this, or I guess post -fess? I don't know. I'm not really prefacing, am I, at this point? But I just want to say, I might just be bad at the game. That is completely a possibility. Maybe this game is, like, super easy, and I'm just really bad at playing it. And maybe my complaints about the game aren't valid. Um, so I just want to say that, because, <laughs> as you might guess, my next complaint is that the game overs, like, restart the game. And if... If it so happens that I'm just bad at the game, one, my original complaint about the, the game overs isn't valid because I don't think it was done to pad out gameplay. And two, my other complaint about the game, about it being like unintentionally more difficult than they like wanted, like that was redundant, but um, like, and if both of those things are like just me being dumb, then I have no other complaints with the game. And I just thought that that was really funny that it's possible that the two biggest complaints I had with the game might not even be like valid complaints. So I just thought I should say that. Um, but me personally, I had trouble with the game a lot. I thought it was hard. Um, probably one of the harder Mario games I've ever played. Um, but again, maybe I'm just bad at it. 
Um, but the other the other side of it is that Chuck Conroy has also been playing uh, this game. Well, maybe not this game, but like uh, like Nintendo games for a long time. He's probably has a lot more experience and like skill at games like this than I do. If, despite me like loving them, it's just like I don't play retro platformers as much as he probably does. Um, but yeah, they kind of went off on a tangent there. But yeah, I just wanted to say that. All right, back to the video. The other major complaint that I have about the game is that game overs completely restart you from the beginning. I cannot imagine going through 90% of the game only to get a game over and start from the beginning of the game and repeat the process. I understand why they did it this way, but I also hate that they did it this way. If I were playing the game as a kid, I would have never beat it since I would have never had enough chances at the later levels to beat them. It's unnecessary and kind of unacceptable. And if I didn't have the save states, I would be screwed. And uh, <clears throat> once again saying this later in the future, uh, I say all of that, I agree with all of that for different reasons, uh, as I explained earlier. So yeah, just reiterating that. But do these complaints ruin the game? Well... It depends. If you're playing the game on an emulator, no, since you can use save states to make the game as easy or hard as you want. However, if you are running this on original hardware, be cautious because it might not be the best experience since you will start from the beginning if you game over. The janky controls don't ruin much, uh, but it does create a handful of frustrating moments, but you can get over that pretty easy. So no. As long as you're playing an emulator, you will have a great time with this game, and it's definitely worth playing at least once. So, Super Mario Land is exactly what you expect going into it. A Mario game based on the Super Mario Bros. series on the Game Boy as a launch title. A little watered down, but it is essentially a full Mario experience. There are some out there that would put this as one of their favorite Mario games, but I honestly can't say I'd put it that high, and I find it wild that there are people who would. As much as I hate to say it, I think this might be at the bottom of my list of Mario games. I do really like it, but you could take any other mainline Mario game and compare them and it just wouldn't be a contest. It was most definitely an important entry in the series, as it was the first without Miyamoto and the first on handheld, but other than that, most of its elements are completely beaten out by other games in the series. The one exception I can see would be the level design. I honestly really loved the level design here. It really felt like there was always something to do, and it was really hard just to speed through everything without getting caught with your pants down. The slightly longer levels helped with that as well, I think. And I didn't write this down, but the themes of each of the levels is a lot better than most other Mario games. For some reason, they just nailed that here. So that's Super Mario Land, a charming little Game Boy game featuring our favorite plumber. Not terrible, but not outstanding either. If I were rating this, I would still give it a 7 out of 10. Mario games are always gems, even if they're not the best, so I find it hard to give it any lower than that. The point is, you will have a good time playing this game, but you just might not want to play it all the way through. But that's okay, as long as you're having fun with what you do play. And that's that! I hope you enjoyed this video, and be sure to expect more very soon. Please take the time to subscribe as well, it'll really help me. If you have any suggestions for new videos, I will gladly take them. I want to know what you guys want to see. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you so much. And I'll see you later. Bye.